Well, welcome. Thank you for coming tonight. We're going to have a beautiful gathering here. And to start things off after this busy day and bring us into the stillness, Svava is going to start us off with a song or two. So, take it away, Svava. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. I'm just so happy to be here. I've never been in Portland before. So, it's, it's very wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Jesus, drive, 
Rest in peace, glory, released from worry, safe in his arms. In silence I hear everything. In silence I This is her first trip to Portland, and this afternoon I kind of had some memories flooding in of my first trip to Portland, which was 31 years ago, and it was back a little bit before that, five years before that, 36 years ago, when A Course in Miracles first came into my hands down in La Jolla. California, Southern California, down near San Diego, and it just blew me away. When I picked it up, I, I did lose my breath. I felt a tsunami of love, and I felt like, oh, I don't even know what the rest of my life will be, but I know it's going in a different trajectory than it had been going, and I was kind of excited about discovering what that new trajectory would be. So, after five years of Pretty much using the Course, the first two and a half years I used it kind of like an oracle where I would just close my eyes and pray and pray and ask questions and then I would pop the book open as like a, a modern day living oracle instead of the Delphic oracle, you know, that the Greeks have. And, oh, this blue book with gold letters, it works really good <laughs> as an oracle. <laughs> and then I would open it up and I would get my answer to my question and then I was so excited I would read on for quite a bit until I got tired, the ego hit resistance, and my eyelids would get heavy, I would close the book, and just follow my intuition, take a nap, take a walk down by the river or you know just uh, have a snack or something light and wait till my, my uh, motivation, my inspiration was strong again and then I would come back and and my oracle waiting for me. Uh, so it was, it was very much based on curiosity and inspiration. It wasn't based on any kind of a ritualistic thing. It was just, what's the prayer of my heart? What's my question? And then, wow, the answers were amazing. And then Jesus would take me, I think he would say, well, we could do this anyway. He'd take me to the library. He said, just go down. I'll tell you which book to pick out. Make your prayer. Don't make this course book special. We can do this with bumper stickers, license plates. <laughs> we can do this with signs and symbols all around. We can do it anywhere you go. Don't feel like it's, you would have to be dependent on one book. You know, I'm with you. And, and I think with The Course of Miracles as with any spiritual pathway, and there are many pathways that lead to God. The Course is just one form of the universal curriculum. But it's just there as a tool to be used by the Spirit to put us in touch with our internal teacher. And it's that simple. And, and the more we make contact with our internal teacher, the less that we need scriptures or 
signs and symbols. You know, we still get lots of signs and symbols anyway, whether we're reading the book or not. But, so that was, in 1986 was when the Course came, and then about five years later was when I kept feeling Jesus was like saying to me, just go west. And I was in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I said, can you be a little more specific? He said, no, actually, that's the way the mind training goes. I give the instructions, you follow. Go west. So Portland was part of the west as well as a lot of other places that I had not been to, or it was my first trip to Portland with Jesus guiding me through the, the Southwest, through uh, like uh, Oklahoma and, and uh, New Mexico, Arizona, Southern California, up the coast, and then when I came up through uh, California, I came up through uh, Oregon went all the way up to Whidbey Island, uh, off the beautiful, uh, on the Pacific Northwest, and, and I met my friend who I had met at uh, Ken and Gloria Wapnick's place back in 1990, uh, when I was up there in the Casco Mountains. And uh, she was very telepathic and tuned into spirit, and yeah, to this day she's just very, very psychic and happy and joyful and tuned in. But that was the first trip to Portland and so that was 31 years ago and then we've been guided to come back. We didn't put a theme or a topic on the session tonight but we were praying about it and, and guidance came in. How practical is guidance? How much fun is it to talk about guidance? our internal guidance. And I can really think of no other topic that is as important in the sense that guidance helps strengthen our trust in the spirit. It helps strengthen our confidence. Uh, Kat was saying that there was a lesson that she had, trust would settle every problem now. You were guided to do, uh, when you were having, my mind on that. focus your mind. Yeah. When her mind was going like this, she called a friend of ours, Linda, and said, can I transcribe one of David's, uh, was it videos or talks? Yeah, one of your weekend retreats. One of the weekend retreats. Mm -hmm. Trust would settle every problem now. And that worked. Yes. <laughs> Transcribing good. that. In fact, that, that lesson really works for us when we learn to give our whole heart and soul to that. Trust would settle every problem now. An amazing idea when we're tempted to look to the future, we're tempted to think of, of a problem based on the past, and, and really the call is to let present trust lead us in everything we think and say and do. Once we surrender over to spirit and we really trust and we live in the moment, then, then everything just becomes like a, I think of that song, La, 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 live for today. Hey, la, 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 live for today. And don't worry about tomorrow anyway. <laughs> well, that could be a good theme song. But it makes it a lot easier when you trust. Because you can say, I don't want to worry. But when you actually trust, you actually have an experience where you're not worried. You're not holding on to regrets from the past, or coulda, woulda, shouldas, or plans for the future. And to me, that's the greatest joy of this whole journey. That's where the happiness and joy comes in. And it's a deep journey, because when I first read the introduction of the Course, it was saying, free will does not mean you can establish the curriculum, it's just you can decide what you want to take at a given time. And then he worked his way to that amazing summary. The course can be therefore summarized as this, nothing real can be threatened, nothing unreal exists, herein lies the peace of God. That fits with all the great um, non-dual teachings from all of the centuries from Advaita Vedanta, and ancient China, and ancient India, 
And that is the same teaching that has been around, but, but what I find with the Course is, is it's Jesus calling us into the practical application of that, to learn to trust so thoroughly and become so focused on the Spirit and so aligned with the Spirit that we live our life without fear. We live our life without worry and concern. So, yeah, that has been a joy and that's part of our coming here, is just to share that, that joy. Actually, Svava's been having some songs kind of spool up in her mind. And speaking of trust, that, that has been the way uh, from the very beginning when we first came together, it involved a lot of steps of trust. Maybe you could share a little bit about that, and then we can also start to talk about the music, because that has a huge amount of trust behind it, too. Wow, well, I didn't know I was going to be speaking tonight. Well, you have to speak closely. <laughs> you can pull it off there if you want to pull it off. There's a mic. Oh, it's, oh, that is, oh, that one. Yeah, that's it. Hello? Yeah, there you go. That's easy. <laughs> that's yeah, that was in, was it 2016? Yeah. And maybe some of you have, I've shared this, this story before, but I was, um, was living in, uh, in Denmark and a uh, single mom with twins, 14 year old twins. And I had been studying the course for six months. And uh, yeah, so I was pretty new, but uh, I had been through a lot of um, yeah, medications and diagnosis and and I um, when the course came in my hands, um, I got it in Danish first and um, and then I heard a voice say, "No, Slava, you have to study this in English." And I closed the book. It was so clear and I felt it so strongly in my heart. So I closed the book and got the book in the, in English instead and started studying. So I've been studying for six months and got guided out of medication and everything it was so clear so uh, so thorough like let, let this go let this go so much down on this and uh, reduce this blah blah and, and after five months i was out of everything um, and uh, then suddenly one day i was just wasn't really searching for anything but this retreat with david in holland uh, showed up on the screen and uh, I just felt in my heart that I, like, almost like I'd already been there. I, I was to be there. And, um, and I signed up and then I got into huge fear and I sent an uh, email to cancel and uh, didn't hear anything back. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I am supposed to go. Um, yeah, and it was such a miracle trip. Uh, I had everything planned out, where to, because I had to fly and I had to take two different trains and a bus to get way out in the country in Holland. And I had never traveled on my own before. So uh, I had it all planned out and, uh, and then my plane was delayed. And uh, I got in so much fear on the plane and was just praying and praying and praying and because my plans were, yeah, it was out of the window at that point. And, uh, and then when the plane landed, I, um, I uh, just, it was like this fear just flipped around. So I was, suddenly I was so excited. I was just in so excitement about that I made it. And, uh, and then I started asking people on the plane uh, how to get to this place. I had the address written down. And, uh, and there was a man close by that uh, he was like, oh, my parents live there. And uh, yeah, it was just so many miracles just getting there. Um, so many people just showing up and supporting me, showing me where to buy a ticket and carrying my bags over to the bus. And it was so many miracles. And then when I finally got to, to the town, uh, it was dark at that point. And, um, and uh, I got out of the bus and I just said, okay, Jesus, what do I do now? And then I heard, turn around and knock on the door. 
of the house behind you. And I turned around and there was a light in the living room. And I walked down there and knocked on the door and this sweet elderly couple opened the door and uh, they didn't speak any English. And uh, so I showed them the address and they, um, the man, he uh, grabbed a paper and, and draw, drawn a map for me to get there. And then he decided to walk with me half of the way and he carried my bag and it was just like amazing. And I was just blown away because there was just like a whole new world suddenly. And yeah, I had no idea what I was doing really. So uh, yeah, and then I got to uh, the retreat center in the evening and the retreat was going to start the day after in the morning. And, and I walked in the cafeteria and there were some people sitting there and uh, I, I usually, you know, I used to be so shy and just hiding and so I got in there and I was just like, is this a retreat with David Hoffmeister? Like, and they were like, yeah, welcome! And they gave me coffee and yeah. So yeah, and, and the next day I met David and I was like, I had never, I had not been following him as a teacher even. It was just like, yeah, I, it was just something so uh, strong that was just pulling me towards just to go deeper, to go deeper with the course. And I had no idea. Then. Yeah, and then I started hearing guidance about what to, that I had to meet they had to talk to David and I was like, no way, I'm just going to sit here in the back and do this retreat and then go back and so, uh, but it was so strong and and uh, one, yeah, one of the first evenings we were watching a movie and I went in there and I sat in the front row and and then I heard in my mind, Svava, now I have arranged it for you, now you go and ask David to talk. And I was like, no way, and I was just holding my hands on the chair and like, no way. But my legs started walking. It was, like, <laughs> I, I, it was something just took over, something so important, but I was just so afraid. And, and then I just suddenly was standing in front of David and I was just like, uh, I, I, like, he couldn't speak. And I said, could I have a one-on-one -on -one with you? And yeah, and then... We had a one-on-one -on -one the next day, and I just heard in my mind what to ask. It was just like, what is going on with me? And, and um, yeah, and then when I got back to Denmark, I, um, I uh, was just feeling that I, so strong call that I had to follow, uh, to follow my heart. I had to go so much deeper with this. And uh, I was, you know, I, I was living with my 14-year-old sons and uh, they were with my ex every other week and, and I just said, okay, if, if I am supposed to follow this and just follow and go and live with David and in the community and everything, that has to be so, so obvious. It has to be so obvious, there is no doubt in my mind and um, and then in the evening I was blowing out candles in my living room and, and one of the candles, uh, the wax, uh, ran, it like fell out of my hand, slipped out of my hand and the wax ran over a photo of me and my sons and the wax just only went over me, just deleted me out of the photo. And then I heard, how does this feel? And I had this huge, huge heart opening experience, like this universal love for, for them, for myself, for, for the whole, like, and I felt such a deep, um, like, um, um, recognition that it was, it was complete. Like my part was complete with this uh, role. And um, yeah, and then I, um, the next day, I think I, I was, oh yeah, also praying about how to explain, how to share this with my sons, and we were having dinner, and then I just started sharing that, yeah, that I felt this in my heart, and and then <laughs> their reflection was like, Mom, you gotta go, you have to go, you have always taught us to follow our heart, and now you go and follow your heart, 
So, and everything was just so given. It was like, you know, I have learned that when it's, yeah, later on, that when it's so, so up, when it's, when it, it is the direction for me, then everything just is so given and so easy, so effortless. Um, so yeah, and it was very quick after, I think it took me four months to just wrap up everything and, and then I went to Mexico with one suitcase and my sons went to live with my ex and everyone happy, yeah. So, yeah, that was kind of the story. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a good story, it just illustrates how we, we really do need to make strong contact with guidance and really put that as something that's important in our life because that's how the Spirit takes us into experiences. And Jesus is telling us in the Course, uh, he does say way back in the clarification of terms, an experience will come that will end your doubting. He doesn't say a concept will come that will end your doubting. He doesn't say a a ritual or an event or a word will come along the way you're doubting. He says an experience. So he's teaching us that we need to have a direct experience of God. And the way we move toward that actual direct experience of God is through our intuition, is through our guidance. What distinguishes the guidance uh, from anything else in this world is that if you might say the Holy Spirit can use anything that the ego made and the ego made the words even. Jim Jesus tells us that words are symbols of symbols twice removed from reality. So words and language is an ego invention. Time space cosmos is an ego invention. Everything that we perceive is an ego invention, and the good news is the Holy Spirit can use anything that the ego made to help us escape from guilt, escape from fear, escape from doubt. And guidance is really a good example of the Holy Spirit using what the ego made. You know, everybody knows that in the Bible, Sermon on the Mount and Jesus talking about the Beatitudes and I was raised Christian and I always loved reading the red letters that Jesus was speaking in the Gospels and I think of all of Jesus' teachings you probably could summarize the whole teaching into judge not <laughs> and yet for 2,000 years people have been going that sounds really good <laughs> but how do you stop a runaway freight train that's going <laughs> down a mountain, you know? You don't. Jesus is basically saying, you just need to start to realize that judgment is a mechanism that the ego made up after the belief in separation, the ego made up many things to protect itself and judgment was one of them. Judgment in comparison is a way that the ego protects itself from being discovered. It's like living in the unconscious mind, just under the surface, and it's invented a lot of defense mechanisms to protect itself from being exposed and released, and judgment is one of those core ones. But if you look at judgment and you say, wow, if the Holy Spirit can use anything that the ego made, then maybe the Holy Spirit can use judgment in a temporary way to guide me out of judgment using judgment which the ego made to guide me away from it till I can reach that pristine still point where there's no judgment, where I go, aha, it's so beautiful. And the world is beautiful without judgment. It's just the judgment and comparison and the evaluation and the ranking and the ordering, the prefer preferences, all of that is what distorts the world and makes it sad. It makes it it brings up sadness and anger and hatred and so forth. So what a great topic we have tonight. And I would say, from my experience, these 36 years with the Course, I really cued in when Jesus said that this, this Course and this pathway, it's not really difficult. 
but it is very, very different. So I like that. Not difficult, not necessarily difficult. We don't have to just throw ourselves into, this is too difficult, or this is too extreme, I'll never be able to really grasp this. And just remember that the guidance is not difficult, but it is very different. For example, Svava was sharing that she had the course, and she was looking at the course in, in Danish, and then Jesus was telling her, the Spirit was saying, read it in English. Well, that's, English was her third language. She was born and raised in Iceland, so there's Icelandic number one, then moved with her family to Denmark, so Danish is number two. So you imagine picking up a book like The Course, which has some three and four syllable words in it, it's not exactly, you know, it's been channeled through a research psychologist with a pretty big vocabulary. And then you can imagine getting the guidance Read it, study it in English. She had to have Google Translate with pretty much every sentence, you know. She could go a sentence or two and then Google Translate, Google Translate. Now again, that's a good example though for us of, of very different. And now, that, that was some years ago, 2016 or so, and now here we are in 2022 and and your English has improved hundreds of percent uh, in that time period, but also you're channeling, receiving all these songs that you receive in English, and you're singing them in English, and then uh, she had to be guided to buy a guitar, go to YouTube to learn how to play <laughs> the, the guitar. When she was a little girl too, she she had played the keyboard. She was very artistic, very expressive. When she was a little girl, she, she played the keyboard until her parents wanted to enter her into contest, you know, in competition, and that just turned her off. So that skill, that keyboard skill, was dormant for decades. And then suddenly it got activated when she was receiving all these songs and she could use, was it Logic Pro, you know, the software and then a keyboard so she could bring violins or bring in instruments that she wanted from these skills that were dormant for decades. And that's another good example about how the guidance works. It's like, it's, it's like sometimes when we look on YouTube and we see this uh, child prodigy who can play, you know, Mozart or Beethoven or something and they're so young and we start to realize that these skills must have been developed prior to their small years of human development. There's a, a movie called The Island, I don't know if you ever saw The Island with Scarlett Johansson, Ewan McGregor, where he's pulling from all these memories that are in consciousness. So his, his life in this world is not really where we develop skills, that's more of a projection of these amazing skills that we have in mind, in consciousness. And a child prodigy is a good example. How can somebody four or five play the violin like that? <laughs> you know, when there are concert violinists that have been practicing for decades that, that have trouble reaching that level, skill level. So in one sense, we can realize that that's part of the guidance is that we tap into and we start to download and, and become into more full awareness of skills. Slava was saying, you were very shy, and I was extremely shy when I was young. Uh, I, and then in high school, I was the most quiet in my senior class. <laughs> and then I went to university, and I would kind of mumble my way and eat my words, and I had such unworthiness, and there was such a fear of speaking. And I was extremely shy all the way into the, the university years, even, even all the way into uh, graduate school. But, but we remember that Moses stuttered, <laughs> and so Jesus and the Spirit used Moses to deliver the Ten Commandments. Uh, Mel Brooks kind of made fun of that word, you know, I give to you these 20 commandments, and then the tablet falls out of his hand. <laughs> 
Ten. <laughs> ten, you know. Mel Brooks came to me. He just, he just dropped ten commandments. <laughs> he tries to cover it. Ten. <laughs> but you see, we all have these these internal skills that are part of our mind and our consciousness. And what Jesus wants to do is use our intuition and use our willingness to listen and follow, to build our confidence, to let skills emerge. And then as we move along, even the use of those skills is just to bring us back to the stillness, to the I am presence prior to time. It's not like Jesus Jesus is wanting us to achieve and accomplish things, even though to the world that may look that way, but it's actually just to come back into the direct connection with God. That's the whole point of everything in time and space, to let it be used by the Holy Spirit to come back to that connection. So, and then when you start to get into it deeper and deeper, I've, I used to go and have lunch with Judy Sketch Whitson uh, and, and William Whitson, her husband, and, and her daughter. We've had uh, wonderful meetings with Tamara and everything. And every time we would be around this very famous Course in Miracles table where they, they had all their meetings throughout all the years and decades, we would be sitting, she'd say, there's a lot of memories connected to this table. <laughs> and we would be talking. But what started to come from my own experiences of following the Holy Spirit and Jesus and from their experiences is we could see that we were living a life, a very prayerful life, where we would just pray and listen and follow. You know, that uh, Julie Roberts movie was Eat, Pray, Love. This was Pray, Listen and Follow. And I was guided to start nonprofit organizations, and then Judy was saying, yeah, so did we. That's what Foundation for Inner Peace was. Um, do you have a business plan? No, we don't either. When they come and check, what's your business plan? We pray, we listen, and follow. So she was some decades ahead of me, but we were like, huh, we've been doing the same thing. And then you start through a devotional life, you start to realize that that Jesus arranges time and space for the miracle. That's something we're just not familiar with when we're growing up. Usually our parents are not telling us when we're children, you know, you'll grow up to arrange time and space as a miracle worker for Jesus, you know. No, not even close. Eat your peas, you know. Uh, but, but the more I got into it, that was the feeling when I took that first trip in 19, 91, go west. I was like, I was like, how am I going to go west? I didn't even have a car. And Jesus said, well, here, to guide me to a car dealership. He said, here's the car I want you to have. It was like a three-cylinder car. Three -cylinder. It was, it, it had such a high gas mileage. You could, it basically would run on fumes. I think sometimes when I would run out of gas, Jesus was in there just running the car for, hundred some more miles on fumes, there's no gas station, just keep driving, go west. <laughs> it's just like, I'll take care, I'll take care of, where am I going to sleep? I'll take care of that. Where am I going to get food? I don't have any bank savings, I don't have any support, I have no church support, I have nothing. I'm taking care of you. And that first trip in which I came to Portland was very much of a listen, follow exercise. You know, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all else will be added unto you. We're familiar with that from 2,000 years ago. And then, of course, in the Course, he has a section called, kind of nicknamed, The Promise. Once you have accepted his plan, the Holy Spirit, as the one function you would fulfill, there will be nothing else the Holy Spirit will not arrange for you without your effort. He will go before you, making straight your path and leaving in your way no stones to trip on and no obstacles to bar your way. Nothing you need will be denied you, not one seeming difficulty but will melt away before you reach it. You need take thought for nothing except the only purpose you would fulfill. 
There was lilies of the field. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. Jesus just like saying, in case you missed it. And you know, I've had it around for 2,000 years. In case you missed it, I'll say it again. I'll say it in poetic words. I'll say it. I'll just warm your heart. I'll, I'm going to lead you. I'm going to guide you. You just have to trust in me. And I could start to feel when I took that first trip in this little gold three-cylinder car that I thought, just go west. Yeah, just go west. It was like, wow, this is going to be a major exercise in trust because uh, you know, I would always be telling Jesus, you know, money doesn't grow on trees and you can't just drive. It's a big country. And, and where are you going to sleep? You know, you, and where are you going to eat? Where are you going to go? He's like, this is part of listen, follow. This is my way of getting you in touch with my guidance. You watch, I'll handle everything. And all you have to do is just be willing. And I said, yeah, but willing to travel, I said, I, he knew I was very shy. I said, I hope you're not expecting to me to talk and give talks or something like this. I mean, you know, I've just been using the book as an oracle, but I'm not like, it's just, I don't think I'm ready. He's like, I know where your readiness is, and you just got, let's, let's do, listen, follow my instructions, and have, enjoy the holy encounters. Meet your brothers and sisters in, in the joy of the moment and trust that everything's provided. And to me that was like, after 10 years of university, undergrad and grad, I was like, this is not how things work on this, in this country, on this planet. And, you know, and he's like, I've been through this all. I've been through this all. I know this place. I know this, I know this planet. I have a feeling he knows all of them. I have a feeling he's, he, he's not even letting on. <laughs> he's like, I got this. And so that was a big leap of faith. And then, actually that first trip, it, I was out on the road in that little gold car for five and a half weeks. And I would say Portland was like close to the, the midpoint. Uh, out through the southwest, up through California and then Portland and then I did go up to meet my friend with uh, Dorothy on Whidbey Island and then came across the, the Northern Plains states and down through Wisconsin and back to Cincinnati. So the first trip was five and a half weeks, then there was a pause and then there was another trip um, that came in the next year that was six weeks down to Florida and actually during that trip the car was taken. And so I was literally just walking with a friend of mine. We would just walk to the beach, we came back, the car was gone, and Jesus was just coming in with course ideas when I'm looking at the empty stall where the car was. <laughs> and Jesus was like, he's just cranking it up a little bit, a little like, I got you, I got you, got you. Even when the car is gone, the people we were gonna stay with came and picked us up, uh, eventually, uh, we went, we, we had a pup tent and that we had borrowed from a friend in Cincinnati and we went to a course meeting and we told her what was happening. Yeah, we, we're staying with some friends, but our car's gone now. They said, oh, let's pass a, a basket of donations. I think the, uh, it was like $50, $52 or something in so many cents. Then we went to a, 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 a place to look for a, t a tent, a used tent, and we found this, a tent that had the exact price they were selling it to us that we had collected at the course group, and we were like, oh God, here we go. You know, it's just like nothing can go wrong when you're in Listen, Follow. You just are, are led to holy encounters, to shine your light, to be joyful, to be happy, to be loving with everyone you meet. And then the Spirit literally takes everything that you seem to need and eventually the car came back and it, was, it had been stripped and you know the steering column and stripped and everything and of course down there in Miami, Florida they had, it happened so often that they had a whole industry of people that restore cars <laughs> and people donated money to us. They, 
they restored it without the cosmetic. It looked like like something from Star Wars, R2 D2. The, with it, we were able to drive it. Just it just takes away all your expectations of how anything should go, and yet you are so lovingly provided for. You, you it's like you're on some kind of a magic carpet ride. Like you've got. You know, the genie is out of the bottle, and with Jesus leading the way, then things unfold. The logistics are taken care of. Now that, that was kind of like knock your socks off miracles. It just kept coming and coming. Every road trip was like, I was like, we could do like a, more than a movie of the week. We could do like a two week uh, series on all the miracles. Because every day was so flooded with so many miracles that we were like, you could, couldn't even put this in a book. The book would be so big. And that would just be from, from the travels. And then as we would continue on, I started to get glimpses of, of really deep experiences. Like, like I remember that first trip when I was coming, before I came to Portland, I was going across southwestern United States and I was meeting people at course groups, and they would say, where are you heading? And I said, west. We're just told west. That's all they told us. So they would say, well, as long as you're going west, when you go to, you know, when you go to, uh, to Albuquerque, or if you go to, uh, you know, Flagstaff, or you go out to California, or whatever, here's, they were giving me little strips of paper. Before iPhones, before email, back in 1991, it was your good old strips of paper with people putting names and phone numbers. I didn't even have a cell phone. I would have to be guided to pull over to one of these phone booths and put in the, the change and then I would call the number on the strip of paper. Who are you? Well, come on over. And people started taking me to their houses. They would take me to course groups. They would Meet my mother, meet this one, meet this. People that I never met with just a name and a phone number on a strip of paper and then you show, call the number when you're prompted to and then they invite you over, they don't want you to leave, they want you to pretty much live with them. They, they give you food, they, come on here, let's do a course group. I got a, it was my third night out on the road on that trip. I think I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I was just driving along and I had one of these, what they call Miracle Distribution Center list of course groups, and so Jesus is like, that's that one, it's, it's, uh, it's 11 to 12 on Sunday, and I'm like, oh, it's Sunday, he said, go to that one. So I go to it, and when I got there, there was like, I don't know, there was maybe like 10 minutes left in the meeting. I said, I'm not going into a course meeting. So he has 10 minutes left on the Sunday morning. Jesus, yes you are. <laughs> so I walk in, there's a big, they're having a big debate about sexuality. Big, <laughs> in the course group, debating this and this. I'm just sitting there, and then 10 minutes later, it's 12 o'clock. They're like, who are you? Where did you come from? I said, I was just traveling through Tulsa, I was just guided to come here. Well, come on, we're going out to lunch. I'll take you to lunch. And then after lunch, this guy Jack, Jack Barnes, I'll, here, come to my condo. Do you play tennis? Here, you can use that, there's a hot tub there. I gotta go do some things. Here's my condo. Now, that, when you're used, to, you know, when you're traveling, and, People start saying, come and take you to lunch and to the condo and stay as long as you want. It's just, it blows your mind because it's just like, what planet is this? You know, what, what have I stumbled upon? And Jesus was just saying, yes, I told you I would take care of everything. And I did read that he said, if you'll do miracles for me, I will arrange time and space for you. That's how it started to feel. It started to feel like a fairy tale, like things were being arranged. The people I was meeting, the places I was staying, the things I was invited to. I was there a whole day with this guy, at this guy Jack's uh, condo. He had to go off and do some work, and then he came back about five o'clock. I got a great idea, he said. Let's do A Course in Miracles potluck on my houseboat tonight. 
You seem to know a lot about the course. We've got questions about sexuality. We'll, we'll just go out and on my houseboat, we'll do a potluck and then we'll have a nice discussion. So that's what we did. We were out on the houseboat, the sun's going down, the moon is shining, we've got watermelon, it's a potluck, we're spitting the seeds off the side. They're asking me all kinds of questions about the course. I'm just thinking, surreal. This is the third night out? Surreal. This is surreal. But this is what Jesus is, he was just kind of going to knock my socks off saying, if you'll just listen and follow me, then I'll take care of everything else. I'll take care of everything that doesn't matter if you'll let me perform miracles through you, if you'll be happy, if you'll let me be joyful through you, I'll take care of all the rest that doesn't matter. And I said, what, what doesn't matter? He said, time and space, <laughs> all these logistics. <laughs> you can see, because I was raised with the Protestant work ethic. That's why, why do you think I was in 10 years full time of university? for the degrees, for the job, for the careers, you know, we, that's part of the whole Protestant work ethic. Take care of yourself. And he was like saying, yeah, well, I want you to be happy and your responsibility is to accept the atonement, to accept the correction in your mind. That's your one responsibility, not this other stuff. This is like the theater, this is the backdrop. I take care of the theater, you accept the atonement. That's your one sole responsibility. And you do that by following guidance and being used as a miracle worker and, and letting the Spirit come through, just through guidance, through intuition. Now, it, as I said, it's not difficult, but, but it is very different because I was trained to be very analytical. I was extremely analytical. I was in engineering. I was in urban planning. These are not kind of, I, I don't call those the intuitive sciences, engineering and urban planning. So I worked my way from there and then he got me over into like psychology, philosophy, sociology, you know, he got me more into the arts and sciences, as I keep coming, and education and, and advanced education. And then bef before I left the university, I was in, I'd gone through school psychology, and I was in this program called Educational Foundations, which is basically studying what is education for. <laughs> and then I get to the course and I open it up and he says, your problem is learning. <laughs> After 10 years full-time education, now you're saying, he said, yeah, you, you learned this whole world of time and space and you never once paused to ask yourself why you were learning this whole thing. Now you have to unlearn everything. And I'm like, oh my gosh. I, I was kind of proud about the 10 years of university and he was like, that's like a chip on your shoulder. I'll take care of that too. <laughs> so you have to understand that, that that's why I say it's very, very different. It's, it's not that it's difficult. I can't really say that my journey over these last 36 years has been difficult. That's not a word at all I would use. I would say very miraculous, but, but I would say that it was so different than anything I planned for my life, than any ambition I ever had for myself, than anything I had ever pursued or thought about pursuing. And Jesus was saying, we have to unlearn it all. But you can do that with my guidance. That this world is learned and that you can unlearn it. My, my mother was a history teacher uh, and she was in education most of her whole life. And I spent a lot of time in, uh, in structured uh, education. But, but I could tell I was on a pathway of listen and follow and learning to be more intuitive and more just simply guided. They say, what is guided is provided. Well, that's the way it's gone for me. It's, it's been very, very provided. Then it started to get kind of surreal, like that one trip, even on the first trip out, I got all these trips of paper, and I remember working my way out. And when I got to Los Angeles area, you know, Los Angeles area is so big, so vast. I had my little car, and I took all the strips of paper out, of my pocket and I, I threw them down on a bedspread and I said, I'm just going to get a map. 
This is before the days of GPS. I'm going to get a, you know, a paper map, I'm going to unfold the map, and I'm going to plot all the invitations and the phone numbers that I got on this map of Los Angeles. And it was, it was a line. And I was like, this is what, this is prearranged? You've prearranged by giving me strips of paper in my pocket? You, he's like, yes, it's all prearranged. Everything we, we do, we seem to do in time and space is part of a prearranged plan. Even Helen Shuckman, who was the scribe of the course, before she started getting, you know, the visions and the dreams and, and hearing that voice, this is a course in miracles, please take notes. Helen Shuckman was told, the world is worsening to an alarming extent and people are being called from all over to accept their part in a pre-arranged plan. Pre-arranged? You mean this whole thing is destined? You mean the script is written? You mean we're just watching our destiny right in front of our eyes every day and it's all part of Jesus has already handled the whole thing. It's all a prearranged plan. And then when you study the course, you do the workbook lessons. Workbook lesson number seven is I see only the past. He's telling us straight out that we're just perceiving through our five senses, our consciousness, we're perceiving the past. And then when you get into the Course a little deeper, like Workbook Lesson 158, he says, you know, we are, we are but looking back on the journey, imagining that we are making it, reviewing what has mentally gone by. He's telling us over and over that what we think is such a big deal, is, is a pre-arranged plan. We are literally viewing a script that is already written. Now, nobody is in the human condition is at that place of seeing it as, as, a, as a written script. But that's why we're talking about guidance tonight, because here I can tell you 36 years after <laughs> that first trip where I got the, the things were laid out on the map, and I'm, I'm like going, is this written already? <laughs> Am I just walking through something that is already done, already prearranged? And he was like, yeah, yeah, you'll see. That we need lots of experiences, we need lots of evidence, we need lots of, lots and lots and lots of experiences before our mind starts to feel that surreal feeling get stronger and stronger, like, like we're dreaming. You know, the Course mentions that you're dreaming, but for most human beings, their nighttime dreams don't seem to be at all like their daily life. They seem to be different. And he's like saying, no, you're dreaming all the time. You're dreaming at night, you're dreaming during the day. The world you perceive is like a motion picture of your unconscious mind. So you're just experiencing your mind. And if you get to lesson 152, you know, you start to realize that, that there's no exceptions to it. The power of decision is my own and there are no exceptions that I'm always just experiencing my state of mind from my consciousness. The, the thing about it is that the reason it doesn't seem to be just a dream is because the unconscious mind is so pushed out of awareness and Jesus, at one point, he called it the unwatched mind. But at one point he says, there's, there's two parts to your self-concept. There's the dream that you dream in secret, and then the dream that you gave away. So what we see right now is this room and this world, stars and planets and everything, is the dream that was given away, as if it's happening to us and we have no control over it. And then there's the dream that we dream in secret, which is the unconscious mind that Freud talked about, that Carl Jung talked about, that a lot of psychologists have talked about, a lot of, I mean, there are spiritualities that have talked about the unconscious mind, the shadow. And, and that's the whole point of, of us going through all these experiences, is to sl slowly 
and hopefully steadily raise this darkness up to awareness and give it to the Holy Spirit. Raise the darkness to the light. That's the formula for awakening. Don't, don't try to hide it, don't try to repress it, don't try to deny it. And so, after, out of these 36 years, and now we have communities that we live in, we just practice no people pleasing, no private thoughts. We, we're going for transparent communication. We're going for hide nothing. We're going for, it's okay, spill the beans. Somebody's, what is it? Tell us. Instead of like, don't say it. Sometimes we grew up in families, don't, don't say it. I can see you're upset, don't you dare. You know, so we're reversing that. Now we're going through a, a healing experience of, of learning to let it up. Well, maybe we've got such great music. I've told you how it, it's been coming through Slava. Maybe we could have another song and then we'll just kind of work our way with maybe some Q&A. We've got enough microphones to, because I know you're curious. <laughs> I can imagine you're curious. Because we're all curious, right? We're all curious to, about guidance and about connecting, about learning to be more open, transparent. Um, I was feeling to sing, this is a new song. It just uh, came recently, so it's called uh, The Flow of Life. And I was thinking about it when you were talking. Now 
know it's all in God's hands. All I know is life is a flow, it is all. Actually, I've been, yeah, been used in different other ways. Yeah, writing poetry and podcasts and yeah. So yeah, it just showed up. It's suddenly it was there. Yeah, yeah, I really love it. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's, it's a good reminder that Jesus says miracles are involuntary and should not be under conscious control. As I've seen Svava just. She'll go off and paint and paint one painting after the next and the next, or write poetry, or a song drops in like, oh, I haven't had a song for over a year, and then here it is, you just heard it, it just comes out. But that's part of, I think, the, the, the real dedication to miracles, because they just, they just come so naturally without like a conscious effort of trying to do something. And that was one of the hardest things for me was, you know, when I would read the Course and I would, you know, when, when you have Jesus saying, you know, I want to perform miracles for you, he's like, what, what is, how am I going to tell my parents about this? You know, you know, it, it just, you, there's a lot of doubt and resistance that can come up when you start to just thinking of yourself as a conduit, or a channel, or a vehicle. Kind of like St. Francis's prayer, Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. What a beautiful prayer in the 1200s that he had, and what a, what a beautiful demonstration St. Francis was. He was so simple. And, and I think, to me, that's where our willingness comes in. We have to just wake up every day and just be willing to be used or to serve the greater plan in some way. We don't even know the specifics or the details, but slowly Jesus has been able to teach me, that's okay, you don't need to know the future. You don't need to know how it's going to work out. Just keep showing up for me. Just show up with willingness, like with just like a little puppy dog with puppy dog eyes, you know, show up and keep showing up again and again and again. And, and then just behold the miracles, behold them. Just see that they're happening all the time. Even Albert Einstein said there's just two ways to look at this world. One is if nothing's a miracle and one is as if everything is a miracle. That's that's one of the most eminent scientists of all time telling us that it's possible to see everything as a miracle. So, to me, that, that just, it's just like it unfolds. Just let life unfold. Just let it show itself. Show itself. And, and you start to get more and more relaxed with it because you start to see, like Jesus says, miracles are natural. When they do not occur, something has gone wrong. 
You see how different that is from our old way of thinking, where we were thinking of miracles as extraordinary, you know, or supernatural. And he's just saying, no, they're natural. It's a natural way of gazing at this world. It's a natural way of, of connecting with your brothers and sisters. It's a, it's a natural way of being. Uh, and he tells us that, that miracles are, are experienced through prayer. That prayer is the medium of miracles. So that's good to know too. Not study is the medium of miracles. Not effort is the medium, but prayer, which is our desire in our heart, that's the medium of miracles. Early on for me, too, I mean, I, I did go off after my 10 years of university and I lived in a hermitage in the woods and, and then I started to go deeper into the experience of, of what Jesus was pointing to. And then over a series of, of months, I had three revelatory experiences where it was the disappearance of the universe, where time and space completely disappeared when I would go into these revelatory experiences. It would be like the three-dimensional world would collapse and it would look very surreal, almost like two-dimensional, and then this blazing light would start streaming in through some of the cracks and then the whole world would disappear. And so what Jesus says in the Course is revelation unites you directly with God. You just have a direct experience of the light that's beyond perception. And revelation is temporary by nature because obviously if it wasn't temporary, <laughs> you just would disappear into the heart of God. And so those are like, I call them like big glimpses. But for me, those were very much boosting my trust, boosting my confidence. It's almost like you you get a chance to pierce the veil and then you can look at the veil in a different way than you ever did before. You, it has less reality for you. Uh, I think it was John Lennon said something like, the closer you come to God, the less real that this world seems. And the closer you are to the world, the less real God seems. And when you read the Course, it's like, that's what Jesus is saying, that this, this is a perceptual realm that was made to keep God out. Sometimes people say ego is edging God out. It was made by the ego to block out the light. And that's why we need so much guidance and we need to let miracles come through us in order to shift our mind to a place where the miracles seem natural. And then we're not so concerned about the outcome. That's been like something we've watched o over time, is we're less and less concerned with the outcome. The more you start to feel it's part of a prearranged script, then why celebrate some outcomes <laughs> and, and be disappointed <laughs> with other outcomes when Jesus is saying, well, they're actually the same. And uh, I will help you see it. He says one point in the Course, Make this year different by making it all the same. He's actually leading us to, to go beyond dif differences. And, and I think the highest teaching for me was when Jesus was saying, the Holy Spirit doesn't see error. So if you really want to be happy, you have to look upon the world the way the Holy Spirit sees the world. The Holy Spirit looks not to effects, for he has already judged their cause. But the cause of the images is the ego. So the Holy Spirit's already overlooked the error. And that is really what true forgiveness is. It's overlooking the error. It's not saying, I, I spot this error, I, I record this error, you did this wrong, you did this, you know, the temptation in the human mind is to, to start to keep score. Okay, you're on thin ice, you made this mistake, and then this one, this one, you know, kind of build a, a case against somebody. And Jesus is saying, if you come back far enough and you join with the Holy Spirit, you won't see error at all. You will overlook the error entirely. 
you see how different that is from human forgiveness, which is, you did this to me, and this, and this, and this, but out of the kindness of my heart, because I'm such a devoted Christian, I'm so devoted to Jesus, I'm going to let it slide, but watch it. I've got these five <laughs> cases here, you see? We're used to building a case and then trying to forgive, and in the song of prayer that Jesus dictated to Helen Shuckman, he says, well, when you collect the evidence and the grievances, and then you forgive after collecting the evidence, he calls that forgiveness to destroy. <laughs> Pretty strong words from Jesus. What we consider forgiveness in this world is forgiveness to destroy. And he's just saying, just keep coming back to me. I want you to see the world in an innocent way. I want you to see the world prior to error. Prior to error. Remember how he said before, Abraham was, I am? He's like saying, come and join me in the I am-ness. <laughs> and you'll see how delightful God is, and how delightful you are, and how innocent you are. But it, it is just, a, I think, like a letting go of, uh, of goals of the world. You know, I I remember when the first time I was watching that movie Gandhi, and I adored that movie, and Gandhi was walking, I think in South Africa, with this American reporter, and the reporter was going, wow, you've done really well, you're building an ashram down here and everything, and, and finally the reporter, his name was Walker, he turned to Gandhi and he said, Mr. Gandhi, you're quite an ambitious fellow. And I was watching and Gandhi's response was, I hope not. <laughs> I was raised as an American, you know, ambition, build, grow, you know, make it better, make it better, and then I hope not. I had to stop the movie. What did he say? <laughs> that was a compliment, Gandhi, and you're saying, I hope not. <laughs> Hope not. So the more you go in with Jesus, you start to realize that, that He's counseling us and directing us to find the present moment. He's, he's teaching us how to be present with God right now. Not to look for our worth in the future with our ambitions and goals. Wow, that's, that, that's the holy instant and that is so different than I was like to Jesus, you know that contradicts all my programming and conditioning <laughs> as, a, as an American, as a, as a, as a human being. <laughs> you know, that is contradicting my past conditioning. And what Jesus is saying is, yeah, it's the conditioning is the ego. He said, I would rather you make your decisions based on present trust than on past learning. So every day, that's a that's a real navigation to make all, all your decisions based on your present trust, based on your intuitive, your higher self that's right in there guiding you step by step with everything. In the face of the temptation to fall back on past learning, in the face of temptation to think, you can, you can take the day off, Jesus. I got this one. I know enough to navigate this day. And he's like, really? Mm. <laughs> you really think you can navigate the day without my help? He's like saying, no, no. That's, that's it. Do we have a song about like letting go um, and letting the trust and the guidance? For
in me. When I believe, I'll set everyone free and clearly see that all is one with me. This is the life I long to live All my pain I want to forgive This is the light I long to give A simple It is your voice I hear so clearly It is your light that surrounds my heart It is your love I feel so Deeply, this is the vision that shows me life. This is the life I long to live. All my pain I want to. This is the love I long to give A simple life in love I want to live This is the life I long to live this is the life I long to give With you I'm released from all the pain With you I'll leave this silly It is your breath that stops the time Your strength turns water to wine It is your eyes that show me who I am Your grace brings me closer to heaven This is the life I long to live All my pain I want to forgive This is the Peace I long to give A simple life in peace I want to live A simple life in light I want to live A simple life in love I want to to
such a healing balm <laughs> to the soul. <laughs> it just rolls off your tongue. Sing these heavenly songs. Yeah, completely just given. Yeah, I, I've never written a song. <laughs> yeah. It's just, yeah. it's come, yeah. I haven't even tried. I don't think it would come anything. I would sit down and try. So it's just given for, for all of us. Yeah. yeah, I think what's beautiful is, too, that that, you know, when you really just say in a prayer, like, I give you, I give you everything to use for your purposes, it is just more spectacular than, of course, anything we could even imagine in terms of form. Because we're used to taking the past and trying to imagine the future. And, and Jesus is saying, well, this whole realm was made by the ego, and it's, it's all fantasy, and it's all dreams, but, but if you give it over and just let it be used for the spirit, you will become indescribably happy from that purpose, from, from letting the spirit use what the ego made. So for me, you know, it started off, you know, I uh, just used the Course as an oracle, and then after some years, oh, maybe go to a course group, and then I go to my first course group, and then by the end of the week, Jesus has me in five course groups. It was like, how did that happen? And then I used to go to this Tuesday night group, and I would just show up and be willing, and then people would go around, read a paragraph or two, and, and then discuss what they were reading, and then have questions, and they started Jesus started coming through me, so they would, a person would read a paragraph, and then there'd be a pause, then somebody would have a question, and then all the heads on Tuesday night would just turn to the David character. It was, it was like a comedy show. If you had filmed it, you wouldn't have believed it, because they would all, they would all read, they would, and somebody would have a question, what about, what does this mean? And all the heads would go. So I find myself being like some kind of a conduit, <laughs> even in course groups, but it was, it was funny. And then the travels, I told you about the first one and the second one, but then it went on around and around the United States. Went, I, I went to 49 out of 50 states. The only one I didn't go to was Alaska, and what was the name of the airlines we were on today? From the Corvo. We were on Alaskan Airlines, Jesus, like, I still am thinking of Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> You're on Alaska, 49 out of 50. And then I went around and around and around the globe many, many, many times to 44 countries. The, the most fun though is when you're going to a country like Argentina and you don't speak the language and you know Jesus is going to have a party. He's just going to have an absolute revival and a party. So the first time, uh, I was not thinking of, I mean, I was going around the United States and Canada, but I was not thinking of world travels. And then I was walking with a friend who I just met, a man named David. We were walking in Indianapolis, Indiana, through a park in the winter. And he said, you should, you should go to other countries. And I said, what? I said, I think I would need a, a thingamajiggy to go to other countries. He said, passport, passport. And I said, well, I don't, know. I don't have one of those. And he said, does your mother have like a birth certificate? Said, yeah. So well, you could call her up and get a passport. So I was, I got my, by then I had a cell phone. I okay. mom, do I have a passport? Yes. Not a passport, a birth certificate. Yes. So then he said, he said, I think you should go to Argentina. I said, Argentina? And he said, I entered, I'm a businessman, so I've entered, I travel a lot, and I entered these contests for frequent flyer miles, and I entered a contest for frequent flyer miles for Latin America airlines, like Grupo Taca and different ones. I said, you did? He said, I won. 
He said, what was the prize? He said, a million. I said, you have a million frequent flyer miles on Latin American Airlines? He said, yes. I want to take you, and you can pick any two people you want. I'll fly you down first class to Hecutiva. It's on, it's on me. I want to use these frequent flyer miles for the, for the good of the plan. He was a course student. Okay. So, okay, mom, do I have, do I have a birth certificate? Yes, yes. So I ended up going down there and I did 19 consecutive gatherings in a country I had never been to. And one of the women that I asked to go with me, she said, she said, you're gonna have a big problem, David, when you get to Argentina. And I said, what? What's the big problem? She said, you speak English and they speak Spanish. And I said, hey, well, that's true, but I think Jesus has got this. So when I got down, never having been to Argentina, when I got down to Argentina, there was 14 great translators, great, great translators that followed me around in different you know, Jesus just sent the ones that he wanted and everything. So it was like a revival. We had, I had some of the women were running down the, <laughs> the aisles. Like it looked like one of the, like one of those revivals, the Pentecostal. <laughs> <laughs> and I, only Jesus can turn a party. Take a shy guy who speaks English down to Argentina. And then, whoosh, you know, it was just mind blowing. And, but that's how we, we come back to that thing, you know, if, when we are just willing to show up, and I was willing, I, I was willing, I didn't know how anything was going to work, none of us do, we really don't, but I was just willing to go and to show up, and then when I would go, the translators all showed up too, and it was amazing, and people were crying, and, and, well, we, you, you know, you do face all the darkness, all the dark thoughts and all the, the struggles and misery that human beings go through comes out in these heart-to-heart -heart gatherings. Because, you, you know, you welcome everybody to share anything and some people just start weeping and crying and they're going through all kinds of things. I swear, we've had healings. There's been an exorcism or maybe more than one exorcism. Mm. There's even been a raising the dead experience. This is not the kind of stuff that we grow up thinking about. But it's in the Course. He says you can heal the sick and raise the dead because you made sickness and death and can abolish them both. He's, this is Jesus Christ. This is, this, is, this is the way, the truth, and the life. And, and we have to realize that with us having contact with his course, that he's got his heights, his sight set on, on the atonement, on us accepting the atonement. You know, he's, he says it's our only responsibility. What about all the other earthly responsibilities? I'll take care of that. Now, I want you to do this very important thing for me, because this is what is for everyone. It's a perceptual hallucination that you're having. But if you follow my instructions, I can take you back into your mind far enough that you can see it for what it is. You can just see the illusion for what it is and remember the truth. And, and, and so I think that's the thing I had to keep doing all along was like, oh my gosh, this just seems so far beyond you know, we had, remember the singer John Denver, who would go, far out! <laughs> this is like, to use John Denver's word, this is far out! <laughs> this is really far out! But, but you start to realize, but it's, Jesus is like saying, yeah, it's the only game in town. It's, it's the only purpose that there is. It's the only purpose worthy of your holy mind, is to give yourself over to this. Do we, do we have our roving mic? There it is! Kenneth, let's open it up. We're ready for the question and answers. We're ready for the question and answers. 
comments. Who wants to go first? <laughs> My question is around, I'm new to the course, so I have questions about two different lessons. And one of them is around the concept of non-compromise. And then the other one is about what happens in the holy relationship when we get this ego struggle and how these two points intersect. And I'm also new to your talks and I've been just like kind of looking for uh, the opportunity to just absorb and receive some guidance in, in these realms. So if there's any words to add to that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, I think that's the tone that you get when you come to the course is this, is this first of all, it's like a non-compromising feel underneath. And then there are some parts of the course where he just comes right out and says, this course will be believed entirely or not at all. That's, that's like super, super, super non-compromising. But he also knows that that he reaches us with our willingness and we just have to have that little spark of willingness. Just that tiny little spark of willingness and openness to kind of begin to ignite or reclaim the power of our mind or, or start to come back to that empowered feeling that we're not at the mercy of the world and we're not at the mercy of all these external forces and, and even things like like people liking us, you know, he mentioned some of those things in, in Work of Less Than 50, I Am Sustained by the Love of God. He throws in that in this world you believe you're sustained by everything but the love of God. And he mentioned um, being liked and knowing the right people. And yeah, that's the, that's the human condition, you know. We, we seem to, the ego made up relationships and made up a world in which it seems to be highly interactive and what people's opinions are of us we care a lot about and what people whether they think highly of us or lowly of us you know it, it gets into a lot of people pleasing uh, at work with a career with our relationship people ple will get into people pleasing codependent relationships with their with their pets but they're animals. <laughs> Before you know it, the animal seems to run the house. <laughs> we can talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> you should see our cat, Unity. But is, is Unity the middle name? What was, we uh, came up with three names. Tiger, Tiger and, and Leela. Depends on Tiger, where she's at. Leela, Unity. Yeah, she's multiple personalities. <laughs> but, uh, but that's good practice because the non-compromising part is basically with our mind, saying, he's saying, you don't watch your thoughts closely enough and, and your emotions just go on the roller coaster ride based on this ego conditioning and you really need to pay closer attention to your thoughts and, and watch your mind. Uh, even in the Bible, you know, Jesus was always telling the apostles, as he would go off on the mount to pray, he would just say, keep keep your lanterns lit and keep watch. And I think he was just telling him, watch your mind. Uh, keep the faith in what I'm teaching you. Watch your mind, don't wander. It's easy to get distracted. And we all know that, it's easy to get distracted. Mm -hmm. So it is uncompromising, but, but still it's, he never gives us more than we're ready for. And then with relationships, holy relationship is really a, an amazing, you could say, teaching, learning, accomplishment, because, because holy relationship is based really on, on giving. And when we believe in the ego, we're used to relationships being giving to get. The getting mechanism is always the ego. And so when we're even looking at getting into a relationship, the ego is like, what am I going to get from this? Or sometimes people will come right out and say that in a relationship. They'll say, what's in it for me? There it is. That's the ego. What's in it for me? And as we start to open up more and more and be used by, by Jesus and the Holy Spirit in, in a more of a broad way that brings a blessing to the, to the whole universe, then 
we start to move in a direction where training our minds to a holy relationship where, where our question is, what can I give? What can I share? What can I extend? How can I be truly helpful? You know, that's a new way of thinking for us. And to start to think that way in more of a predominant way, because uh, we're used to breaking everything into compartments and, and certainly that's the same with relationships. And then Jesus is saying, whatever you perceive is lacking in any situation is what you have failed to give. That's so helpful because that brings it back to, again, to what we're willing to give. And he's not talking about necessarily giving in the way that we've been accustomed to thinking. Like we think of giving in terms of physical terms a lot and financial terms and philanthropy, for example. We think of the great philanthropist and Jesus. He's got number seven in his characteristics of the teacher of God where he's talking about generosity and he says that, that what he's teaching with generosity is actually the opposite of what the world believes generosity to be. So it's like, how fascinating, because we have our ideas of what generosity is. And then he's talking more about going into deep prayer and coming into this attitude, like the Beatitudes of, of love and acceptance and respect and equality and all those things. That's what Jesus feels is truly generous, is when we're in the Beatitudes that he talked about 2,000 years ago. Whereas the ego has all kinds of ideas of generosity and it's usually very tied into physicality and to materiality and and money. Uh, and, and the more you give, you know, the ego is like watching, like, even in terms of that, like, well, you gave this much, and then it will slip in its expectations. Now, you need to get something back. Like when, with Christmas, you know, we got away from the holiness of, of the present moment, and we got into gift giving. And then even as children, you know, we, we, got into the gift giving thing and then our expectation, what did you get me for Christmas? I got you this, what did you, you see the reciprocity, it's so ingrained in the human condition, what am I going to get back? What's coming back to me as a person? And Jesus is trying to rinse that from our mind. So I think that's the ongoing thing is, is that's where prayer and inspiration comes in, it's just every day, just letting yourself be used for miracles and, and saying, what can I give today? What would you have me share? What would you have me extend? I know for me, I mean, I, if Jesus had showed me a motion picture of how my life would go in these 36 years, I just would have run the other way. <laughs> Imagine being shy and then seeing the fat going. Yikes! <laughs> That's a nightmare for somebody who's shy. That's an absolute nightmare. But, but I, I was just willing to kind of step into it and step into it. Even when I started to put stuff on the internet, I was like, I really, when I was in university, I was not so thrilled about the internet or taking classes about the internet or you know, developing web pages or doing anything like that. I didn't even like email. Uh, I was kind of anti, I was anti-tech. I was like, I was shy and I was anti-tech. And then Jesus said, I can work with that. I'll, <laughs> I'll use you as a mouthpiece. And, and before long they were saying, I was a tech mystic. I said, a tech mystic? That's a strange combination. But it was just because Jesus kept saying, when you do these talks, please put them on the internet so people can listen to them. When you do these videos, please put them up. At the beginning it was like, upload that video to YouTube. I said, what is, what's a YouTube? What is a YouTube? Or, you know, I mean, every single new technology in advance, Jesus was right there on the front of it saying, this is a good one, use this. And I'm like, what is that? What is that? I don't even know what that is. But I had to be willing to kind of 
even do that, put things up and be transparent. That was just not my way to share things on the internet. This was way prior to Facebook, <laughs> you know? And, and little by little, we just start to just, okay, what do I feel? What, what can I give? What can I share? What can I extend? And, and then the more we're willing, the more spirit just takes it and, and expands it in ways that we can't imagine. And it does that with everything. It does that with our, with our relationships. It, it just absolutely expands everything. It expands our perception of, of what we even think is possible. So, I think it's good, you're just starting out with the course. What an adventure, I, I, I know for me, I'm, I'm trying to convey, it's been a major, a huge adventure, but, but it was just started with that little spark of willingness. Thank you for asking that. Hi. Hi. Um, so, I've been doing the course for about five years, and certain things have gotten a lot easier to do. Um, but I'm coming up with, I want to be willing, I want to hand things over, but when I'm like, get triggered, and then I'm deep in it, and I know the truth, but how do I get out? <laughs> it's like I see both sides, right? But I'm just, society says, you shouldn't be treated that way, your partner shouldn't do that, like, but I'm treated like it repeatedly, and I don't know, yeah, the ego saying this, then the part's like, well, this just isn't okay. You should walk away. But it's presenting itself again to me for my lesson. But how do I make it easier for me? Because I'm resisting. It's, it's hard. Yeah. That's kind of my question. How do, yeah. I, how do I get out of it a little bit easier? Yeah. I, I think... I think at some point I started to, yeah, face a lot of those things that you're talking about and just like, think like, this does seem difficult. <laughs> you said it wasn't difficult. <laughs> this seems very difficult, and this is intense, and this and this and this. And, and Jesus would just kind of talk to me gently and just say, well, it, it comes down to this belief in worthiness. Like, he's saying, for most human beings, they have such a deep-seated feeling of unworthiness. And that's how the ego set it up made all these bodies, and then made us body dependent. And then we think, I just want some love. And then you try to do a partnership, and then, oh, this unworthiness comes up, and, and then the partners and the, the people, they act it out. You know, it's bravo, it's Golden Globe Award, Oscar for, the act, for that acting out of that dark, unconscious belief. So, I think for most people, the, the the purification and the, the letting it up and letting it out is, is very intense because it's, it's reflected back to us. And really, in partnerships, it's very close. It's like right in our nose. It's like right in our face. And it's, it's extreme. You, you can have the thoughts from the Course and you say, it's wonderful, that sounds so beautiful, that's so poetic, and then this is absolutely insane. This feels like I'm dying here, you know, and, and how do you put those together? But I think as you start to, to read that passage where Jesus says, nothing you think or do or say or make can establish your worth. Your worth is established by God. There's this deeper feeling like, wow, if God is the one who created me and established my worth, and if I'm going through all this, it must be like some kind of major flush. And, and I think that's, that's what the Course is. It's such a straight shot at bringing the darkness to the light. There's a point in the Course where he says, you will not go on alone, mighty companions go with you. And, and for me, it's, it's taken different forms. Like when I traveled around the world, there would be certain ones just showing up that were just like, oh, it was so helpful to feel their love, and feel their nurturing, and feel their support. And, and even when I was guided to, to 
start nonprofits or to start communities. I've had different communities that have sprung up in different parts of the world, and and it, they were intense too because because it was really like an experiment in transparency. And the ego is saying, don't ever let this darkness up because everyone will leave and you'll just be completely alone if you let it up. So it's been quite a journey of expression sessions and people bringing things up. But overall, that, that's worked out really well too. It's this sense of, of looking to the world to meet our needs. We look to a partner to meet our emotional needs. We look to jobs and careers to meet our financial needs. We've been kind of addicted to this ego thinking and it's had us looking outside, looking to the images all the time uh, for our needs getting met. And and to me, that was the whole value in, in listen, follow, and learn to, to listen and follow. Because I was saying from the beginning, like, to Jesus, I do not know how this is going to work. This, this sounds way beyond me. This sounds like a pie in the sky idea. And what are you saying? Go west. Oh, just, it's just not enough information. <laughs> That's just not enough information. <laughs> This West in the United States from Cincinnati, it's a big country. But then he was like, just give me a chance, let me show you. Work with me, let me show you. Yeah, this is going to, your mind has to flip from this fear and doubt and suspicion to have lots of miracles. I knew I needed lots of miracles. I needed to be flooded with miracles before I'd start to turn things around because the conditioning was, was so strong. So, Jesus would just say, well, each day should be devoted to miracles, and I'd say, well, that's going to be interesting, because I've been devoting 10 years in university, and I've jobs, and I've been putting my energy into a lot of things, but, wow, it's one thing to read your book, but then to just jump in, wow, this is, you know, this seems like a big leap. But that's the thing that that has been convincing. I mean, even with the idea of hearing the voice of Jesus, in the Course, Jesus says it's, it's very rare for anyone to hear the voice for God. And then he comes in with the workbook lessons, the voice for God speaks to me all through the day without interrupting my activities at any point. You know, I'm like, <laughs> like I had two guys from this, one guy from Italy and one guy from I think Argentina, and they love getting on with me because they just just have a session like five all these questions to me and everything. But we were going through the workbook and they were like, well here's where Jesus starts talking about hearing the voice for God. And then he continues on in the workbook and these two, uh, Gabriel and Henry were like, but we didn't hear the voice. And now we're doing all these lessons where it's like talking to us like we can hear the voice. But we can't hear the voice. Mm. So then they were rolling it back. David, what, they were trying to really ask me questions like, what about, why can't we hear the voice? And, and I just was saying, well, I think it's, it's to the extent that we're kind of invested in this world that blocks the Holy Spirit. He says, the Holy Spirit is as loud as your willingness to listen. And if I'm invested in all kinds of things in this world and all kinds of ambitions and outcomes, that must mean I don't really want to listen to the Holy Spirit. Because I, if I'm invested in the world, I would perceive the voice of the Holy Spirit as the great sacrifice. What have I got to give up? Woe is me, what do I have to give up now? What's next do I have to give up? And, and Jesus had to convince me that by following Him, that it was joyful, it was fun, it was happy. I used to even say, I said, why would anyone go for truth if they thought they had to struggle for a whole life? Can't this be fun? And Jesus said, yes, let's make this fun. I'll make it fun for you. Thank you. I, I, that would help. Uh, <laughs> that's, you're going to get me attracted to miracles if the fun factor is, is strong. So. I think 
it's not easy to look at, but when you look at the things that come up, it's like, you know, the ego is singing that Pat Benatar song, treat me right, dun dun dun, you know, I've got to be treated right. And then the spirit is like saying, well, what is it that you're invested in, or what is it that you want to be right about, or what is it that you're so strongly holding on to with your hands gripped on that that you're ma making yourself, you're disturbing yourself by by clinging and holding on. I mean, for me, travel was great because I, as David, did not really like to travel. I, I used to go out with my family vacations and my sister and I were like, my mom was playing, I see something that you don't see and the color of it is green and after like going through Missouri and Nebraska and Oklahoma, I see something, no, stop it. When do we get to the hotel, the motel with the swimming pool? <laughs> don't want to play any more games. We're bored. We hate this. This is terrible. We won't go on any more vacations unless you have motels with swimming pools. <laughs> you know, we're not even getting in the car. So I did not like to travel, but then Jesus used the travel to undo my dislike and my preferences with a new purpose. It wasn't for sightseeing, it wasn't for, you know, some of the old things. And I think that's the way you have to kind of see it with relationships too. Like, wow, I, I need a new way of looking at this relationship where I see it as a, as a way that extends the blessing. And I think the more devoted I became to this new way of looking at the world, I had people just contacting me, sending me movies, sending me music, inviting me to places, far off places. I mean, one guy was an elected, he was a judge over in uh, Hungary, and he's writing to me, I love your stuff, I'm so into this, he's taking spiritual pilgrimages, and doing all these things, and he's a judge, that's what he does for a living, you know. I'm like, wow, what a day job. <laughs> he's like totally swept away by Jesus, and he's a judge during the day. And then he's like, here's my family, you know, nowadays you can do phone, here they are, they all want to meet you, and oh, hi there, and everything. But, but eventually, when you start to really give yourself over to it, you start to draw forth people as witnesses to your own calling of your heart. Like, I had this, after years of traveling, I finally was guided to this little house called the Peace House, which Svava is just about ready to take a trip to. She's gonna try to remodel <laughs> the top floor of this. This house was built in 1847. But I had people wanting to to rent houses on the same street I was on because I was just happy. They wanted to live nearby and be my neighbor. <laughs> and come over for tea and things like that. And I thought, how cool. I was not looking to set up a community, but when people start moving on your street, what are you gonna do? You know, it's like, <laughs> okay, uh, let's, let's enjoy. And, and then, it starts to move in that direction because your purpose is that way. So I think it's the same with your relationship. If, if you're really wanting to open up, like you say, five years with the Course, and you're wanting to just deepen into it, and that's the prayer of your heart, then Jesus will arrange time and space, even in terms of relationships. And people don't realize how deeply Jesus will do this, even with uh, the publisher of A Course in Miracles, Judy Scutch. Uh, one time I was visiting her and, and um, she was telling me that she was married to a man named Bob, Bob Scutch, and they were married and then she got a, uh, there was a speech writer for the President of the United States, uh, who was in Washington, D.C., who contacted Judy and said, uh, why don't you come to Washington, D.C.? And she said, no, no, I'm not coming to Washington, D.C. My husband and I are living in the Bay Area and this and, and this uh, speech writer, he said, well, you really should come and I want you to meet somebody. He's, he's been involved in the military and 
this and that. And she, I'm not interested in anybody from the military. And she said, he studies the Course of Miracles. <laughs> she, oh. So she goes over, she meets this tall, handsome ex-military guy, and, and he starts talking to her, and they're talking the Course and everything, and she's a married woman. And he's over there, and she's talking to him, and his name is William Woodson, and the more they talk, the more at some point they go to some seminars together, they're in the same hotel, different rooms and everything, but they finally they're sitting together, she tells me, on, on the couch. And she's like thinking, what is this all about? What, what's, what's this whole thing about? And she basically, he turns to her and he says, I think we should ask Jesus what the purpose of our relationship is. She said, that's a very good question, let's ask Jesus right now. <laughs> so they asked, and then she's like, after a few minutes, what did you hear? He said, I heard everything. What? Our purpose? Our, for our relationship is everything? And he said, yes friend, and trusted, confident, and lover, and he went through all these things, and she's a married woman, and she's like, oh my God. So she flies back to her husband, Bob, and Bob's into the course and everything, and Bob said, what happened? What? Did you meet him? I want to meet this guy. She said, that's not a good idea. <laughs> that is not a good idea. She's, he says, I really want to meet him. I just he has such a good feel. Invite him to come to our house. She said, that is not a good idea at all. So finally, he persists, persisted. So finally, William comes, flies all the way across. It's like when Harry, what, what's the one, uh, Sleepless in Seattle. Like, he flies across and comes there, and he's, he's, and her husband Bob is so happy. And the two hit it off like their long lost brothers, like they just adore each other and everything. And so she's watching this, he's there for some days and she's like, thinking this is not good at all. And then one day she's doing the dishes and the two men are out on the patio outside of uh, where she's doing the dishes, screen door is open, she's listening and they're talking sports, sports teams, sports scores, talking to me. And then suddenly, her husband, Bob, said to William, what are your intentions with Judy? In the middle of a sports talk, she's like, and, and then William said, my intentions are to marry her. And she said, then they went right back to talking sports. <laughs> How's this for your divine intervention? So finally, when William finally leaves, you know, she goes to her husband, Bob, and she says, I heard what you were talking about. I was listening. I heard you talking sports. Don't think I don't know what, what she said to him. Don't think I, I was paying attention. And her husband said, that's William. She said, well, yeah, that's William. And she, he said, I already showed you. He was channeling from Jesus. He had his own notebooks he was filling up. And he had already showed her a passage that said, When William appears, let Judy go with William. And she said, What? You mean those, the dumb notebooks that you're filling? He said, I'm tuning into Jesus. And Jesus gave, I already showed you this passage. She said, Oh my God. Well, sure enough, she ended up marrying. William, and the three of them worked for decades together, translating and sharing the Course in all these languages, and that was even showing how Jesus arranges even relationships for the purpose of awakening. You see how different that is from the human perceptions of even relationships. You know, some people would say Jesus would never do... Mm. <laughs> if, it's, if it's for the plan of awakening, yeah. So, there's a part that I talk, talked about earlier in the introduction to the Course where Jesus says, free will does not mean you can establish the curriculum, it just means you can decide what you want to take at a given time. And then, in the Manual for Teachers, Jesus says, 
that you can't even choose the form of the curriculum. That's an amazing thing. When, when we think in terms of spirituality, we think that we as persons can choose whether we're going to study a course, or the Arantia book, or Buddhism, or Hinduism. It's all part of a prearranged plan. Everything we think we're deciding on our own is just symbols. And it's all meant to loosen us from believing we're a body, we're a person, we're a personality. And, and I've seen it, Jesus will orchestrate everything. He obviously took a shy guy from Cincinnati. He turned it into more than WKRP in Cincinnati. He took me all over the world in ways I couldn't even imagine. And, and still, it still has that feeling like, wow, I just need to show up with willingness for the miracle. And then the rest is just given. And that, that applies too with relationships, you know, when, when you have difficult relationships or you start to get down on yourself for re repeating the same patterns over and over and over, that's just another opportunity to just choose again and, and say, okay, I'm, I'm giving this relationship. I'm saying to Jesus, I mean it. I'm giving this relationship to you to use for your purposes. And that's what I did. And then all of a sudden I had all these relationships even recently, uh, I, I got a prompt to call this friend of mine who, who I met, uh, her name's Tanya, I met her I think about 2013 down in Georgia and she was originally from Ukraine and she wanted to start to put Russian subtitles onto my videos and so I told her who to hook up with, so she did that and then suddenly this Russian course community about around my teaching started to grow and grow. She said, it's there in Moscow and they're in St. Petersburg and that was years ago. Now she's, she's said, would you, would you do a, there are a lot of Russian speaking people all over the world that, that are working with the course and your teachings, would you do a Zoom call? So that's what I'm going to be doing on, on November 8th with Russian speaking people from all over the world. But you see how different that is of letting Jesus arrange the relationships. It just, it's like turning from this little thing into a symphony, like into a huge symphony. Especially for a shy guy from Cincinnati, this is like unheard of. He's like, he's doing a big symphony. But, but it still comes back to that willingness of just, I just want to be truly helpful and, and serve the plan in whatever way would be most helpful. That's all my prayer is, and then things just show up. But you see, it's, it's, it's based on the giving motive. It's not based on what am I going to get from this person. We don't, we're not. We're just going to show up and beam it out, and, and it'll be a collaboration of Russian, English, and core students all over the world. But there's another woman, I think she's going to translate for me, and she lives in Oregon. The, there's a Russian speaking one who's right here in Oregon is going to be on that. And Tanya is in North Carolina. But that just shows how it's, it's just a broader perspective of relationships. And the more broad we let it be, the less we feel codependent, the less we feel, I need this, this, this. We're just wanting to give and feeling blessed by the relationships. And that's getting into what we talked about, holy relationship. It's very expansive because it's based on giving. And uh, it, it gets away from that, uh, you know. Like with relationships, codependent relationship, it always comes down to these expectation and demands. There's like, there's like a line. Okay, here's the line. You cross this line, it's over. And, and, and then Jesus says in the Course, the Holy Spirit never demands, and the Holy Spirit never commands. Oh my gosh, what kind of relationship would I have if I, if I followed the Holy Spirit and I never demanded or commanded another person? You know, that you can see, wow, that would be transforming. That would be otherworldly. <laughs> it feels like it would be otherworldly. And in, that, in one sense it is, it's kind of like, it's, it's in a different realm than the egoic 
level. So yeah, I just would hang in with it and yeah, expect miracles. <laughs> uh, first off, I just want to thank you for all your teachings through the years. I first was introduced to the Course through Marianne Williamson's book, A Return to Love, so it's been in since the 90s. Sometimes it's a very slow journey. Um, we had a teacher that introduced the Course and wanted to do a six-week program. And there were several of us signed up, and six years later, he said, it. It just went on and on. So I had a really beautiful long time with a wonderful teacher. So really blessed to have that. Um, I guess my question is about being predestined. What came up for me was if it's predestined, then is our suffering just caused from our resistance to what's predestined? Yeah, yeah that's a good way of summarizing it. Uh, there's a part in the in the workbook, I think it's maybe it's in lesson 135 where Jesus says something to the effect of what could you not accept if you but knew that everything that seems to happen is gently planned for you by one who knows your good. Wow. Just one sentence like that is like, wow. But that's a good way of putting it, that, that it's just the resistance to to the form, and, and resistance we mean thinking the form should be, be different. And, and the ego's plan of salvation is if, if something was different in the form, if someone acted differently or thought differently or behaved differently, I would be happy and, and saved. And then the Holy Spirit's plan is if I would just change my mind on the world I'm seeing, then I would be happy. So the Holy Spirit's plan is entirely focused on a shift of perception, a change of mind, a change of purpose. And the ego's plan is all 100% focused on change of form. But when we, when we want a change of form, it definitely means we have expectations. And I like that part in the manual for teachers where one of the characteristics of teachers is um, patience. And Jesus says, patience is natural to those who trust. No outcome already seen or yet to come can cause them fear. Wow, that's got to be a deep watching to be able to watch with the Holy Spirit. But I think you're right on to it. And then, then you do start to pay attention to where you notice the resistance. And then you, you start to really go, hmm, this is fascinating. Like for me, when I've gone through, I've gone through all these years and then I started knowing my appetite started to go away. And I thought, that's interesting. I think I was, wasn't I doing a, something over in Europe one time where I didn't, I didn't, I just quit eating for some weeks. And, I was just kind of, it was just the way it was. But, but then the ego could say, that's just not human. You know, you know, the ego will have, it's one thing to go on a certain kind of keto diet or this and this, but just to stop eating, that's just, because it's a past association, you know, it's just an association with food, it's an association with, with tasting and things, it's just all these associations. And, I do find that the deeper we go, these, it's just Jesus is gently loosening associations. And where we resist that loosening of associations is where we have an investment. There's like an ego investment. I want it thus. No, I should be able to have the hot foot Sunday and be enlightened. Like, what do you need a hot foot Sunday for? I want it. I like, you know, you can see it just goes back and forth because it's like slowly, it's almost like evaporating. The ego is evaporating. There's even one part in the Course where Jesus says, do not breathe life into your failing ego. Mm -hmm. Isn't that an interesting line? Do not breathe life into your failing ego. Like, let it go. It's, it's, it's fading. 
It's fading. Let it fade. Let it keep fading. And then the ego, hell no, I don't want to fade. <laughs> I want to be, you know, in charge or whatever. So it's good that you're onto it. I mean, it's good that you can even articulate it in that kind of simple way because in the end, we want to be loving with ourselves. We want to be nurturing with ourselves. We want to be gentle with ourselves. We don't want to fight and kick and struggle. We don't want to turn things into a challenge. We just want to, we want to go softly. You go, go softly into the night. <laughs> I just wanted to share also my, one of my experiences that was huge for me in listening to guidance. Um, I lived in a duplex for nine years. Things were not great, but you know. And I heard a voice say, you're going to move. Where am I moving? You're gonna move. And then next came, and you can do it the easy way or the hard way. And my whole life I saw I'd done things the hard way. And I said, okay, I'll do it the easy way. And I just prepared and I sold everything. Well, 90%. <laughs> and that journey forward that happened in 2018, I want to say. And I literally had nowhere to go that I knew of. I just moved forward in having an epic sale, getting rid of stuff, giving people stuff, just getting it out. And it led me down this path of house sitting, pet sitting you know, a whole different stream of income, living in beautiful homes. I had friends that took me in and said, you're gonna come live with us after this year long house sitting. And she said, you're gonna move with us. And until you go on your trip, you know, and I went on a trip and then I came back. And she called while I was on the trip and she said, hey, I know you, you know, I said, come back and live with us. And, Stay with us until you figure out what you want to do. But we're we bought a new house. Would you house it for us in the old house until it sells? Sure, I'll do that. And then just right before I knew it was selling and it was going to sell, and so it was February of 2020. They just picked me up and moved me to the new house. And then the pandemic hit. And everything was, has been such a miracle. And since then, I'm, I am a massage therapist. I have my own business, so very dependent on working. But they weren't charging me rent. And everything was so provided. It is just it's such a miracle. And I, had, I stayed with them. I was six weeks off for the pandemic. I've had two hip surgeries, so I was off six weeks. I would have had I stayed in the duplex or thought to have my home or feel like that was something I had to do, it would not have done, I don't think. Mm -hmm. But that's how miraculous things can be when you do this. It's pretty cool. It shows the easy way. <laughs> that's so nice. You gave an option. Hard, you want hard or easy? Easy. Let's go easy this time. <laughs> Divine 
love, a pure presence, I am bright and whole. The one creation, eternal.
inspired. Stay in love. Yes, thank you. Thank you.